of thousands of people attend Tony Robbins events every year, but there's an event that only takes place once a year in the States where 2,500 people from all over the world come to Florida to experience one of his most intimate and intensive programs, Date with Destiny. It's six days of total immersion, and the people who go through this don't just discover who they are, what drives them, and their ultimate purpose in life. They dive deep into how they interact with others and discover new things about their relationships. Yeah, this is the place where you deal with the hard stuff. And with thousands of people in a room, digging into their pasts, envisioning their future, you name it. You can imagine how emotionally charged the room gets and how personal of an experience Date with Destiny is. So it's not hard to understand why Tony never allowed cameras in to document the event. That all changed when he met acclaimed documentary filmmaker, Joe Berlinger. Tony and Joe were first introduced to each other by two other heavy hitters in the entertainment industry, Brian Koppelman and David Levian who themselves had attended Date with Destiny and ultimately went on to executive produce the documentary. Now, you might be wondering why Joe would have pursued a subject like Date with Destiny in the first place. You might be especially curious as to why he felt so strongly about it that he pressed Tony for years to agree to it. After all, Berlinger is known for investigative films like the Paradise Lost trilogy about the West Memphis Three, which exposes cracks in the criminal justice system, and Crude, which is about pollution in the Amazon from giant oil companies. His work, for the most part, has been geared toward taking us into the issues of the world that are often obscured by media or politics and uncovering disturbing truths. So for this film, it's a bit of a departure in subject. Motivation, the storytelling, the deep dive into parts unknown, that's all there. And that's what made the endeavor a clear choice for Joe. The film is called Tony Robbins, I Am Not Your Guru, and it premiered at South by Southwest in March, followed by a string of showings at film festivals the documentary was picked up by Netflix, and it will premiere to members worldwide on July 15th. Here to talk with us today about the making of the documentary is Joe Berlinger. Joe, thanks for coming on the show. Of course, glad to be here. So I'd love to start actually with some personal history um, so we can understand how you got to where you are today. What was your path to becoming a filmmaker? Oh, I had the most circuitous route to becoming a filmmaker. It was not what I was planning. I was actually a language major in college and fluent in German as a result of that. I, my focus was on German and I spoke French, uh, but really German was, I was quite proficient. And my only goal in college was to figure out how to live in Europe, uh, get paid to speak languages. And that was the goal. So somehow I bluffed my way into a job at a huge international um, advertising agency, Ogilvy and Mather, oh, wow. which, is, which is based in New York. Yeah. Um, but they had a Frankfurt office and they were looking for a young American to go uh, kind of be a client service person to coordinate the, 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 the activities of American clients um, advertising in Europe. Uh, basically, I was kind of like this glorified account executive People, when I tell them that and <laughs> see what I've done since, have a hard time wrapping their heads around that. But uh, really, I was not interested in anything other than finding a way to, you know, live overseas and, and, and speak German. Uh, it got me into the media business, and my first time on a TV, on any film set, was uh, on a TV commercial shoot uh, in Germany. And that's when the kind of the light bulb went off, you know, so I'm, I'm 22 at this point. Uh, I had gone to Colgate University, uh, again, as a language major. But when I was in Germany, uh, I'm on a TV commercial set for the first time. And that's when the lights, camera, action kind of, you know, caught my attention. And I realized, oh, this, this part of the business is really interesting. So I spent a couple of years in Germany, you know, trying to figure out how to get to that side of the business eventually. Um, went back to New York with Ogilvy uh, as a, a, a producer on American Express commercials. We then hired the Maisel brothers, who are the seminal, you know, 1960s cinema verite kind of godfathers. They did films like Salesman, Grey Gardens, Gimme Shelter. Um, and when I was, uh, you know, working in at Ogilvy, we hired these guys to shoot some unscripted television commercials and I kind of hit it off with one of the brothers, David Mazels, who died, you know, several 
actually two decades ago. Um, the other brother, Albert, died uh, just recently. But I particularly hit it off with David Maisels. And, and over lunch, I, I explained to him that, hey, I, I'm looking to get into the film business. And uh, he said, well, we, we would love to do more TV commercials because they're lucrative. So we cooked up a plan where I would come work for them and basically become their executive producer for television commercials, which meant I shopped their reel around to Madison Avenue to get them more advertising work. But I used that five-year period as, as my film school and learned everything I could about documentaries. That is also where I met Bruce Sanofsky, who I made a number of my early films with. Uh, Bruce also sadly just passed away. Um, and Bruce and I did Brothers Keeper together there while we were, you know, basically Brothers Keeper was a moonlighting operation while we uh, worked. He was an editor and I was their marketing guy. And uh, while we were uh, there, we made Brothers Keeper. And when Brothers Keeper needed to find money to be edited, uh, we got the money from a now defunct PBS program called American Playhouse. And when that funding came through, we left the Maisels and, and started our own company. And uh, that was kind of the start of my film career. And Brothers Keeper, you know, which was financed on a dozen credit cards and all the money we had in the world at the time. Ultimately, it went to Sundance, uh, won a prize, and kind of that, that launched uh, our careers. Wow, that's a great story. And you know, and the and the irony of it is, you know, I, I was never intending to be, you know, a documentarian per se. So now that I'm one of the recognized people in my field, it's I, I look back now. Of course, I think everything now. I look back and think everything happens for a reason. And of course, I was I was destined uh, to do this, and it's been an amazing life adventure to go drop into people's worlds. Uh, you know, whether it's a week, a month, or in the case of the West Memphis Three, you know, 20 years. And it's such a privilege to be able to tell these stories. But, you know, when I met the Maisel brothers as a producer on TV commercials, and that kind of launched my, my entry into the film business, I could have just as easily, you know, at the time, I wasn't looking for documentary production. So uh, I could have just as easily had been part of the team that hired Ridley Scott to shoot a commercial. And if I had hit it off with Ridley Scott, maybe I would have gone off to Hollywood and made a completely different kind of film career. So I just find it um, very ironic uh, to, 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 you know, the role of chance and coincidence in one's life, I find, uh, you know, very interesting. You've talked a little bit before about how you got involved with Tony, right? You met him at a party, you guys talked, you hit it off. Um, but had you heard of him before then? And if so, what was your sort of general impression? Um, you know, interestingly, um, I, I, I actually had gravitated towards some of Tony. Tony has one particular DVD series called Lessons in Mastery that I bought a long time ago. And you know, I'm not a self-help person, or so I thought, uh, you know, um, and I'm not uh, a seminar kind of person. I mean, I didn't even know Tony did seminars when I met him. I, I just had this very um, superficial perception and misperception of that guy who did all those commercials, who the guy on the elevator from Shallow Hal. You know, I, I did. Uh -huh. I, I of course, I of course knew of his public persona, and I knew he he did these DVDs. And in fact, I was, you know, I don't normally gravitate to, towards that kind of thing. Or, but those lessons in mastery, I actually there there have been a couple of times in my life um, where I've pulled those. I think I, they were audio cassettes, so that shows you how old it was when I bought those. So, <laughs> so I I had I had listened. You know, I, now that I've met a lot of hardcore Tony Robbins fans, you know, I was not one of those people who, you know, bought every book, every DVD, go to the seminars. But ironically, I my only foray into listening to something to help me um, was that Lessons in Mastery years ago, you know, and a couple of times in my 20s and my 30s, I like in moments of like where I'm trying to figure stuff out, I have I have. I had pulled those things out. But by the time I had met Tony uh, at this party in 2012, I was well into my 
current career and I just hadn't, I had forgotten that I even owned those audio cassettes. And so I hadn't been exposed to Tony in a really long time. And I only had the most superficial perception of, you know, who he was. Um, and so when we met at this party, you know, we just, I was just captivated by his charisma, his warmth, his immediate interest in who I was. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's, what brought us together conversationally was um, he was told that I was the guy who did the Metallica film. And I think he really dug Metallica, some kind of monster, which is, you know, has a connection to this film, of course, you know, the, the film, the Metallica is a, about a band in crisis and they hire a therapist and it's about discovering who you are and the vicissitudes of fame and fortune and not being satisfied, you know, with, the role that you're playing. So there's, you know, there's a lot of connections, I think, between, on the one hand, this film is is very much a departure from what I'm known for, but I actually think of it as kind of a cousin to the Metallica film. So we just struck up a conversation. Um, he, he, of course, is, you know, very charismatic, um, very interesting. Uh, and I think he sensed that something was going on in my life at the time, which we can get into in a minute. I, I, we weren't discussing what was going on in my life, but I think he had a sense that there was some, you know, unsettled business because he, you know, and I said to him, hey, I actually told him, you know, I, I, I have your lessons in mastery audio cassettes, but since the formats have changed, I never updated it. And, uh, you know, I haven't listened to it in a long time, but you know, I, I, and so, you know, we just, we chatted. I, I said, I didn't know you did seminars and, uh, but he invited me to one, you know, um, and for, you know, I, I, I went home and I discussed it with my wife. She said, sure, go for it, you know, and I, as I was getting in the car to go to the airport, as I was getting on the plane to fly to Palm Springs, California, which where Date with Destiny was held until they switched to Boca the year that I shot it in 2014. So, uh, you know, uh, the entire time I'm headed out there, uh, I'm wondering, why am I doing this? You know, I'm a super busy guy. You know, if you were to look at my film credits and TV credits on IMDb, you would see for a 54-year-old person, uh, I have, at the time I was 50, I've done quite a bit. You know, I've worked, quite, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a workaholic, so... For me to take six days out of my life to go to some seminar that I had never really heard of and me not being a seminar person, uh, I was surprised. Something was pulling me there, you know, and I, as I, at each leg of the journey, as I made my way to the, to, to Palm Springs, I, I kept wondering, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know, um, but there was something about Tony that, that, and our conversation that just hit a nerve and I decided to to check it out. Something pulled you there and you were there day one and you mentioned that you had a reaction where you wanted to leave, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, <laughs> but yes, you didn't want to yeah. insult him because that's, you're that, sitting right, up front. That's, <laughs> right. That's, that's the other half of the story. You know, I get there, I get, I get to date with Destiny. I realize, you know, Tony is very generous and, and invites, I wasn't the only person he invited, you know, at any of these events there are, you know, quite a few people from all walks of life that he's encountered in his recent travels, uh, you know, who he's invited. So I was one of quite a few people that were there as his guest. Uh, and um, one of Tony's uh, people and uh, was, uh, you know, a Date with Destiny staffer is actually assigned uh, to making sure, you know, his, his people are taken care of. Um, and so... I realized I wasn't quite anonymous there, uh, you know, which, you know, on the, at first I felt, Oh, very, you know, I felt special. Oh boy. Not only has he invited me here, but there's somebody here checking in with me and, and his other guests, of course, you know, it wasn't exclusively for me, you know, to make sure you're, you're having a good time. So I, you know, at first I felt, Oh, this is wow. How, what a thoughtful, nice guy. Um, and of course I still think that, but at the time, you know, I thought, wow, this is really thoughtful and this is great. And so the thing starts, you know, and at, at after the first break, um, 
I didn't walk. I ran for the exit doors and all my red flags were going off. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? I have got to get out of here. Obviously, something was touching a raw nerve. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who looks through the camera uh, for a reason. I'm, I'm, I'm an observer of life, or so I thought, not a participant, you know. Um, I... You know, the idea of pairing off with a stranger, you know, and starting to reveal kind of innermost thoughts and, you know, let's face it, there's music and, and physicality yeah. and, and hugging, you know, uh -huh. and I don't want to, I don't want to overplay that for people and scare them off. Most of the seminar is not that, but in the first two hours, you know, he, he want, you know, you're, you're getting oriented into this world and, you know, a big part of what he does is that physical is, is remaining active and dancing and jumping. And, uh, because that's when the breakthroughs happen, when your energy is at a certain level. So you get much more of it at the beginning because you're just getting introduced to that. So I had no idea what I was stepping into. I had no idea about all the amazing, very content rich stuff that was going to happen. Um, over the next six days, all I knew is I was in a room with a lot of people, lots of loud music, jumping up and down, hugging a stranger, pairing off with somebody because, you know, you pair off with, a, you find a partner if you, if you haven't come with somebody. And in fact, if you've come with somebody, you know, you're encouraged to, you know, maybe not partner with the person you've come with. Um, so I, I fled for the exit doors. I mean, again, all of my red flags were going off. I called my wife, Lauren, and I said, oh, my God, I have got to get out of here. I can't believe that I've signed up for six days of this. You know, Tony is is very aware that I'm here because there's somebody assigned to his guests. And, like, what's my exit strategy here so I don't insult the guy who so nicely invited me here? But I, I just can't last six days. <laughs> and my wife, bless her heart, said, look – you know, you've carved out the time. You you rarely take time for yourself like this. You've mm -hmm. you you just stick it out. Give it another day before you make any rash decisions. It was great advice because on day two, there is a guided memory exercise that you see in the film. In the film, it's only about three or four minutes, and in the actual date with destiny, it was more like forty minutes long. And so I found myself, you know as Tony takes you back to your earliest childhood memory and encourages you to go to the memory before that, that you, that you on the surface have, have forgotten. Uh, it, it's a whole process to kind of re release you from the burdens of the things that have held you back. And for me, you know, my childhood was not an easy childhood. And so that's the area that is the sore spot with me, uh, that, that, is the, the source of a lot of the chains kind of that bind me uh, or held me back. And so I, I did that exercise. I opened my eyes after about 40 minutes in a room of 2,500 people. It was the first time when my eyes were shut that I tuned out the rest of the world and, and did not think about the fact that I was in a room of this many people. And I was flooded in tears and I cried like I hadn't cried that I could ever remember crying that much. Um, and I thought, and I felt a weight lift. Now it wasn't like, you know, a light bulb went off and all of a sudden, you know, the angels appear and like my life is now perfect. Okay. It was just a moment of lightness where I felt, wow, I haven't felt this way in a long time. Something profound happened in that moment. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, if something could make me feel this way, even for a moment, then there's something here and let me give it a shot. And so I, it totally changed my attitude for the next five days and I decided to stick it out. And, you know, look, not every program, every aspect of every program is going to reson resonate. You know, it's not like 100% of the time you feel like, oh, this is for me. But at, from that point on, I decided to give it a shot and I, you know, and other people have different approaches, but for me, I kind of cherry picked lots of amazing moments and amazing philosophical ways of approaching life 
Uh, and as a result, uh, there are certain tools and the tools that I absorb are, hopefully will be different than the tools other people absorb because it's really up to you, which is why the film is called I Am Not Your Guru, because it's really not Tony telling you what to do. It's Tony helping you find your path in whatever way that means for you. Um, so at, by the end of the seminar, I was, you know, I, I had a transformation. I felt like I took a journey quite reluctantly. I, I went in kicking and screaming and came out the other end with some real tools and, and really felt transformed. Um, and that's when I realized I wanted to make a film about it. So I called Tony and I thanked him profusely for uh, the experience. And um, I said, you know, not only was it, and I told him the whole story I just said here that, uh, you know, the first two hours I wanted to get the hell out, but I stuck it out and it became something I wasn't expecting. And I said, I, I'd really love to make a film about this. Um, you know, f on the most basic level, I wanted to make a film because, you know, it's in the event is inherently cinematic. You know, those the 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 interventions that he does, you just feel this energy in the room that I just felt would translate onto the big screen or the little screen in the case of Netflix. <laughs> um, and uh, also the other thing I wanted to do with the film that I thought was fascinating is I've never experienced um, the camaraderie that's in the room. You know, very quickly, uh, people from all walks of life, uh, the barriers fall, there, and, it's, and, and it moves from self-interest. You know, of course, everyone's there to improve their lives, so that's inherently self-interested, and that certainly is a, is a big part of it. But there's also this communal caring and this spirit of connection with one another and this rooting for other people. You see it in the dawn sequence. You know, that, that room is, in, the, in my documentary, this, the, the room is you know, is on their feet in tears, sending this woman love, you know, this woman who went through horrible physical abuse uh, as a child, and she tells that story. And I, I've just never experienced, I mean, a room full of people who just kind of, the boundaries fall, and there's, a, there's this spirit of love and connection, which uh, I, I thought would be a f great thing to bring to the screen. Um, and, you know, so I, I told him, hey, I'd love to make a film. Um, and he was initially resistant, uh, resistant because he was concerned that doc a documentary crew would somehow interfere with the experience uh, of the attendees, which I can understand. You know, he has cameras there, but they kind of hang back and those cameras are designed to capture images for the jumbotron so that anyone in that room of 2,500, no matter where Tony is, people can look up on the screen and see the action just like in a rock concert, you know. Um, it's different when you have an outside crew coming in and, you know, really getting some of the up and close stuff that we got. He was afraid that that would interfere with the attendees' experience. Um, he was also concerned that, you know, it's a 72-hour content-rich experience and the interventions for example in real life can take two two and a half hours and yet i'm reducing them to a scene in a documentary which means seven eight minutes uh and the entire film is only two hours or less because that's kind of the you know running time of a documentary so he was you know concerned that somehow the condensation of time would trivialize the experience it wouldn't capture the true essence of for example, in the interventions, the emotional arc that he takes people through. Um, and those were both legit concerns. And so it took me two years to, you know, wear him down <laughs> and convince him that those concerns would be addressed. And I, co I convinced him about the condensation of time, not to be concerned about that, by sending him my films and saying, look, you know, that is the nature of documentary. All documentaries are hyper-reality on a certain level because unless you're going to actually live the event 
anything you see a film about, you're trusting the filmmaker to make the right choices to capture the emotional truthfulness of a situation as opposed to the literal truthfulness, meaning the literal truthfulness is the 72 hours, but the two-hour film will capture the emotional truthfulness. <clears throat> and you know, I gave the example, look at my Paradise Lost documentaries. That was six weeks of murder trial, but you only see about 60 minutes of all of that murder trial in the original documentary because part of the documentary is behind the scenes and in the town, but there's about an hour of actual trial. And yet that was a five or six week trial in real life, but nobody questions whether I haven't captured the emotional truthfulness of what went on in that courtroom. So he got that argument as he started to watch more of my films. Um, the other concern about impeding the experience of the viewer you know, I just originally I wanted to come with, you know, I wanted him to give me the permission to give me a, a letter, actually, an access letter saying, hey, yes, you can make this film. And then I would go out and raise money for it. Um, and so I felt I couldn't start the film until he gave me, you know, unfettered permission to shoot the event. And finally, I said, look, I'll come on my own risk. I won't get another entity involved. Let me come. We'll start shooting the event. And if at any time you feel like the presence of the documentary, you know, my presence the, or the or the crew is impeding in the in in your attendees experience, um, we will, you know, we'll shut it down. You can tell me to go home and I'll, I'll give you the footage to use how, how you want. But you know, we'll shut the film down. I wasn't giving him permission to control or the content of the movie, you know, which I want to be clear about. You know, I, I had final cut of the film, but I was giving him permission to say, okay, you know what, this is not working, shut it down. And so once I gave him that safety valve, he agreed, he finally agreed to let me come in 2014 and shoot. So, Joe, you told IndieWire earlier this year that the goal was really to share this profound experience that you yourself underwent, yeah. but that this event might not be for everyone. Can you talk a little bit about the range of experiences that are at Date with Destiny? Yeah, you know, um, like any event, I think different people get different things out of it. And in fact, one of the things that I found so amazing about the event is the range of people and why they're there. I mean, as you see in the film, you know, there are a number of people there, you know, who are thinking about suicide. And yet there are a number of people there who are, you know, well-known celebrities who are just looking to get to the next level. You know, at, at my particular date with Destiny uh, that we shot at, uh, you know, there was Maria Menounos, Derek Huff, uh, you, you know, other well-known people who or successful people who, uh, you know, may not be a household name, but are extremely successful. Um, there are people of all socioeconomic strata. Um, and so everyone's looking for different things. Some people get a lot out of the relationship day. Some people are looking to heal issues from their childhood, which frankly, that was me. Um, you know, so I think, I think there's no one reason to be there. No, kind of prototypical person who attends. And I think that's kind of the amazing thing. And, you know, I was talking before about the camaraderie in the room. That, that's what I found so amazing because there's a, there's a group of people who the boundaries fall. There's a feeling of love and connection in the room between people who, like, if you were all at a party, you wouldn't quite understand why all these people are in the same room in another situation because they're really from all walks of life. They're people you may not necessarily be friends with in other circumstances and yet there's just a feeling of connection. And that's really what I wanted to bring to the screen. You know, one of the things um, that people will find interesting about this film and is potentially a liability is that I'm a incredibly skeptical person with regard to my filmmaking um, and document, documentary making in general is a skeptical uh, or can be a skeptical endeavor. Um, and this is a film where I wanted to do something different with the documentary form specifically instead of, you know, one of, one of my pet peeves, I would say, 
is that documentary, the definition of documentary these days seems to be wrapped up in this idea that documentary has to be an investigative takedown piece of some social ill. Now, I've made many of those films. I've taken on FBI corruption. I've taken on pollution in the Amazon by corporate polluters. I've taken on you know, prosecutorial misconduct, uh, wrongful conviction. I mean, I've taken on a lot of tough issues, a lot of social ills that need to be addressed. So I'm not knocking that. I've, I've contributed to the trend. And in fact, because of the gutting of print journalism, and because of corporate ownership of the news media, uh, a lot of investigative reporting is, is, is only being done by documentarians. So, you know, a lot of social issues are only being addressed by documentarians because the blurring of the line between entertainment and news in corporately controlled uh, uh, television networks has made certain stories taboo, like certain stories – a network won't touch for fear of offending advertisers. Um, and that's just the reality of the world we live in. So I'm not knocking that kind of documentary, but in many people's minds, documentary has become equated with the investigative takedown piece. And I wanted to do something very different, which is to, I had an amazing experience uh, at Date with Destiny. I thought it was inherently cinematic, and I wanted to do something a little different with the documentary form, which is to just give people this kind of experience. Uh, you know, I liken the film to a concert film, but it's like a concert of human emotion. And I'm not here to critique Tony or his methods, to bring in third party voices to talk about whether it's bad or good. You know, I'm just here to share the experience, and I hope the viewer gets something out of it. I'm not saying, you know, I didn't make this film so that people go run and sign up for Tony Robbins seminars. If that happens, I think people will get a lot out of it. But I'm, I just wanted to share an experience that if the viewer spends the two hour running time of the film thinking about the direction of their own life, thinking about how to become more satisfied, how to become more grateful, which is the, if I had to boil it down to what I got out of date with destiny it was gratitude for for the wonderful circumstances of my life which i had been taking for granted and causing me to be never satisfied if i had to boil it down that's what i got out of date with destiny um and i just wanted to share that experience with people and if people spend two hours thinking about the direction of their own lives and learning how to become more fulfilled then i will consider the film a success and ironically i think it's very much connected to my previous films of looking at social ills, even though it feels very different in this sense. And that is, I believe if, and this is, this belief came out of attending the seminar, if more people were more satisfied with their life, if more people felt a love and connection to their fellow human being, if more people felt self-actualized and felt like they had a purpose and a mission in their life, maybe there would be less social ills in the world for us documentarians to point cameras at. Now, that's a little Pollyannish. I don't believe social ills are going to go away. But this was my goal in making the film, was to share a positive experience. And you can make of it what you want. Um, you know, I'm expecting, you know a wide range of reaction to the film when it comes out. You know, I think for the Tony Robbins fans who have been to the seminars and, you know, are, are, are locked in to what Tony's about. I think they're obviously going to love the movie. And I think I probably could have just put Tony's voice against the giant black screen and not shown any picture. And people, people with those people would love the film. I think we live in a very cynical society full of people who think they know better, unfortunately. And I think those people, you know, the haters are going to hate no matter what, because Tony can be polarizing. Um, and I think as Taylor Swift says, uh, I can't believe I'm quoting Taylor Swift, um, <laughs> you know, the haters are going to hate and I, I, I'm not going to please those people, you know, and that's probably 20% of the audience. But the people I'm interested in with this film 
again, it's not about go take a Tony Robbins seminar, but the people I'm interested in are in the middle, you know, because the Tony fans are going to love it. The haters are going to hate it. But that the, the people in the middle, like me, who had some, you know, perception of who Tony is, or maybe had no perception, who might come into the film with some predisposition towards thinking that this groupthink mentality is a bad thing, you know, using that word, because I don't think it's groupthink, but that's the word they would use, mm-hmm. or not being sure what to think, but but taking a journey, just like my journey. I went from, you know, kicking and screaming, like, oh, I got to go back in there because I don't want to insult Tony, uh, to having this amazing transformation. And that's the journey I want people to take with this movie, to not being sure what they can get out of it, but by the end of it, if they've related to some of the characters on the screen, if they've, if that has allowed people to think about the direction of their own life and to make some positive changes or to, you know, um, think about taking the next step, then I think the film will be a success. And that was really my, my goal. You know, I was a, a jury member at a big documentary festival in uh, Amsterdam a couple of years ago. It's called IDFA, the International Documentary Festival. Amsterdam, it's actually the largest documentary festival in the world. Very, you know, you know, just it's adored by people around, you know, who love documentaries. And so I was a juror and the main venue is um, a, a, like a 14 or 16 screen Pathé multiplex um and i was i arrived late and was leaving early so i really had to cram in a bunch of films in a short period of time so i was taking a break after my third really downer film uh about some terrible thing uh you know on a day that i was seeing like four or five films and i was eating a sandwich in the food court of the theater and just kind of looked around at all the screens and i saw a giant line in front of the campus rape documentary and a giant line in front of the latest corporate, you know, polluter documentary and a giant line in front of the latest political scandal documentary. And I just, I almost felt like I was in a New Yorker cartoon that this is what documentary has become. It's become the negative takedown of some problem. And again, I don't want to knock that kind of film because I think they're important for all the reasons I said before. But I just wanted to do something positive and share a positive experience and and hope that people get something out of it. And because of that orientation um, that I spoke of, that um, documentaries seem to be more about where's the takedown, where's the dark side, um, it's been interesting uh, and it will be interesting when the film actually comes out to see what people write about it. But I'm expecting to I'm expecting negative <laughs> reviews because I think reviewers and critics are going to want to say, well, where's the dark side of Tony Robbins? Where's the balance? You know, wh- why haven't you shown the people who had a bad time? I mean, these are actually some comments I've heard from some early reviews. Where's the dark side? Where's the balance? And to me, I think this is an incredibly objective and balanced documentary because I'm not telling you what to think. I have faithfully recreated and all of the people who have seen the film who have gone to date with Destiny have marveled at how accurate my portrayal is despite only being two of 72 hours of an event. Um, You know, I'm not telling you what to think about the event. If you have a negative predisposition towards Tony Robbins and you see this film, it might confirm it. If you have no idea about him, hopefully this this will expose you to some new ideas, but some people, it may not be for them. Um, so this film is incredibly objective because I'm I'm faithfully capturing an event and not telling you what to think about it. Just like in a concert film, a music concert film, you know, the filmmaker... You know, if the drummer in that particular show is not drumming as well as he usually does, or it's the guitar line is not what you you appreciate on the studio album versus the live version, there's not a filmmaker there telling you those things and telling you, oh, that guitar playing is not good, or that drummer, you know, had an affair. You know, it's... 
I'm, it, it's an immersive experiential film where you're free to make your own decision. So it's been interesting, the reaction, because I've now screened it, you know, and I deeply appreciate Netflix very early on supporting the film. And it's great that it's going to be on Netflix in part because obviously it reaches this global audience, but also it allows you to play the movie back and forth. And if you want to go back to a certain spot, you know, because you want to get something out of it, you know, Netflix in many ways is the perfect venue. So I appreciate how early they got involved in the film and how excited they've been. But the one thing about this film that, you know, seeing it in a big room with a lot of people as we've done at film festivals. So it's not going to have a traditional theatrical release. It's going to go out on Netflix and that's great. But having done a number of film festivals and special screenings and seeing the film in a room of seven, 800 people, uh, it's a powerful experience for people. I mean, people have given us standing ovations, flooded in tears, have told me how moved they've been people who, you know, of course the fans, find it to be a perfect encapsulation of the event. It's the non-fans who have said, you know, I went into the film thinking, oh, I'm going to hate this guy. Uh, and, and, and coming out the other side, you know, being totally transformed uh, by the viewing experience and wanting to know more. So, so there's, there's a disconnect between what the people who are watching the film uh, are feeling and what some critics are saying, like, where's the dark side? Where's, you know, it's like, that's, I'm 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 giving you an event, and I, I I didn't find a dark side, so I'm not going to report on a dark side that for me didn't exist. Sure, and you know it's interesting too because there's plenty of darkness in it. You know, people have been calling it. Uh, there, I think there was a headline. Uh, you know, the feel good film, yeah. and it's not a feel good film, right? It's uh, it's not something you just Netflix and chill with. You know, with your friends, it's definitely right. still an emotional investment. So. It's going to be interesting to see what the reaction will be when it does come out right on Netflix um, yeah. and it, it has this broad audience. I'm excited to see what people think. So uh, just, you know, one more question. I'm um, sort of wondering what's next, right? I mean, you mentioned that uh, his events are inherently cinematic and there could potentially even be, um, you know, future film or television narratives around this. I think it's just, it's fascinating, right? Because people are surprising. And moving forward, you know, these events keep happening. So yeah. I imagine that you yourself, though, are moving on to a different subject. Um, what's your next project on? Yeah, you know, I've got a, quite a few things. I mean, I have to say this experience has opened my eyes to wanting to figure out how to, you know, do more on human consciousness and spiritual growth and those kinds of things. I haven't quite figured out what uh, I want to do in that realm. Um, and so, so for those people who actually know and like my films and are worried that I'm going off in this new direction and not going to go back to my <laughs> deeply okay. investigative, my, you know, I, 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 you know, I jokingly tell people I make feel bad movies. You know, yeah. The gritty I, stuff. You yeah. know, because I've, I've done films about such horrible subjects, but you know, it's because I want to shine a light on, 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 I like to give a voice to the voiceless and shine a light on injustice. And, and that is something that, you know, is a big part of my background and, 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 filmmaking background. It's something I will continue. You know, I'm doing a show right now for Discovery on a guy, uh, Richard Glossip, who's on uh, death row uh, and the state of Oklahoma wants to kill him. Uh, many, many people think he's innocent. And, uh, you know, so I'm trying to, sh and he's exhausted all of his appeals. So, you know, I'm doing that. I'm doing a film about uh, genocide. So, you know, back to my dark and gloomy subjects, uh, you know, uh, so uh, uh, very busy and I, you know, I certainly will continue making the kinds of films that, you know, speak to me, which is, you know, shining a light on injustice and, you know, um, being part of this very important movement of, you know, modern day documentary in this, um, kind of era of corporate ownership of the media, really telling stories that sometimes, um, that kind of media is afraid to tell, but my eyes have definitely been opened to, you know, using documentary, using the documentary form um, for a different reason, which is to inspire, uh, to, to, to look at human growth and development, because I think, as I said before, if we all feel connected to one another, 
you know, that's another way of attacking many of the problems in the world is if we, 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 we feel for one another, if we have empathy for one another. And I think that's what, I think that's what Tony does uh, so brilliantly. Um, at the end of the day, you know, he, he creates these connections uh, between people and he uh, allows you to reach, if you want, you know, uh, your better self. And it's not like at the end of the seminar, boom, you're finished. It's again why I call the film I'm Not Your Guru because it really requires you to continually work on yourself. Um, but I think if we're all working on ourselves and feeling connected to not just one another but to who you really are, uh, I think that's that's as an effective way to counter all the problems there are in the world, uh, just as effective as pointing a camera at the problems and saying, "Hey, look at these problems." But I, I so so I think I'll be doing both. Uh, but I thank Tony for that that kind of eye-opening experience. Yeah, and thank you, Joe. You did a great job with this, and I think everybody listening, uh, you know, tune into Netflix. July fifteenth, it will be available. It is called Tony Robbins. I am not your guru. All right, thanks, Joe. Cool. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You can find Joe Berlinger's documentary Tony Robbins. I am not your guru on Netflix starting July fifteenth. And to learn more about Tony Robbins and Date with Destiny visit www.tonyrobbins.com slash documentary. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed by Tony Robbins and hosted by Anna York. Carrie Song is our executive producer. Tyler Colbertson is our associate producer. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Special thanks to Diane Adcock and Mary Buckheit for their creative review. Copyright Robbins Research International. <laughs>